Okay, so we're going to get started. I have some introductory remarks before our present, uh, presenters start. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Snyder from the Connect and Communicate Series Planning Committee. Thank you for joining us for this presentation, Health Information for Distance Learning. This presentation will be recorded and it will be made available to Pennsylvania Library Association College and Research Division members through the PALA website, as well as sent to registrants and available on the CRD blog. For this presentation, you will only need a headset or speakers. We encourage you to ask questions in the chat box at the bottom right. We will hold questions until the end, but as you think of them, you're welcome to add them to the chat box. We'll also do our best to assist participants with technical issues. Please post those issues in the chat box as well. This session is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Library Association College and Research Division's Connect and Communicate series. I'd like to thank the CRD board for supporting the Connect and Communicate initiative and the other Connect and Communicate Planning Committee members, Aaron Burns, Ron Alicioco, Sarah Pike, and Diane Porterfield. Please contact any one of our team for information about becoming a PALA member. And finally, I'd like to thank and introduce our presenters for today's event. Brad Long is the Embedded Health Sciences Librarian for the Penn State College of Medicine's University Park Regional Campus. He has over 25 years of experience in medical librarianship in both academic and clinical settings. Brad has experience in reference and instructional services, curriculum development, consumer health and patient education, distance education and collection development. He is currently the chair of the Medical Library Association's Libraries and Health Sciences Curriculum Caucus and serves on Duty Enterprises Library Board of Advisors. Kate Fluelling is the Executive Director of the National Network of Libraries and Medicine Mid-Atlantic Region based at the University of Pittsburgh. After beginning her career as an Associate Fellow at the National Library of Medicine, she was coordinator of instruction for the SUNY Upstate Medical University Health Sciences Library. In 2017, she was named one of 50 distinguished alumni of the School of Information Studies, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. She is the current chair of the Mid-Atlantic chapter of the Medical Library Association. And with that, I'd like to welcome Brad and Kate and we'll turn the presentation over to them. Hello, um, I'm gonna actually start, start off and as a uh, speaker disclaimer, uh, I am gonna be talking about a commercial resource from Duty Enterprises. Although I don't have any uh, financial interest in the product, I am an unpaid member of the Board of Library Advisors for Duty Enterprises. So basically, I'm gonna, we're gonna to talk today about two types of health information. Uh, first, academic major and professional resources. Um, as we've been dealing with the pandemic, uh, I, I think we have, as a profession, done a really good job uh, making sure that the resources for our uh, majors and the, those working at the professional level are available to them. Uh, I'm not gonna get into a whole lot about that type of information right now, but I do also wanna move on to an area where I think as academic libraries, we may need to concentrate a little more on it, and I think it's become a little more evident because of the pandemic, and that is uh, consumer health information. So, <clears throat> the Medical Library Association Consumer and Patient Education section back in 1996 uh, put this definition out. I think it's it very much hits on ev everything it, uh, about it. Health, and medical topics in requests are in response to requests by the general public, uh, including the patients and families. And as our students have been go have been sent home um, to to do their own work, they they have had questions about what is COVID nineteen and how do I you know prevent myself from getting it? You know, do I do I have to worry? So. I, uh, a lot of uh, libraries have been putting together guides in, uh, along, along these lines, but I think it all also um, is something that uh, we need to be aware of is traditionally um, 
college students haven't been coming to us for consumer health information. I mean, they think of us as a place to come to for information on their majors, uh, information on recreation, and th those kinds of things. But now I think they are looking to us for uh, to be a portal for consumer health information. So I'm gonna to touch a little bit about that to today. <clears throat> and not all consumer health information is the same and not all of it's reliable. So I'm just gonna to touch a little bit about a couple of uh, tools out there for dealing with the misinformation out there. Uh, probably a lot of people have heard about the CRAP test, and this is a, I'm providing a Wikipedia link to that. But also there's another one, which I think is a little more detailed, is called If I Apply. It was developed by uh, Marshall University Libraries, and uh, one of the uh, developers is also uh, now on the uh, staff of Penn State University Libraries. So... <clears throat> Uh, so go ahead, take a look at these resources uh, if, if you have a chance, and feel free to share them with your students as you're uh, moving through uh, dealing with misinformation. Uh, I have some observations of, I would say, from about the 30,000 foot uh, view of libraries throughout the country and then probably about the 10 foot view from uh, within Penn State University libraries. Uh, but I think we've been very proactive with distance education support during the uh, current pandemic. Uh, from what I've noticed, uh, there were four steps that we were dealing with as libraries uh, almost simultaneously, and not all of us were dealing with them in the same order, but we we're uh, the big one was addressing all aspects of remote access for students, faculty, and staff, uh, as much as making sure uh, people had computers so they can continue their education, uh, so that uh, our faculty knew how to use Zoom and our, uh, our staff uh, knew whether they were working from home or not and how, how to handle uh, coming into work if they had to until we were uh, all pretty much forced to work from home. And as I mentioned, reaching out to our teaching and research faculty, we've done a really good job with that. Uh, um, being, being there to support them, especially with uh, readings, you know, helping them with uh, course reserves, helping them uh, Link to uh, textbooks uh, that uh, maybe the students didn't, you know, lost access to their textbooks because this happened at spring break and students weren't able to get back to their dorms to get them. So, so we've done, a, I think, a really great job with that. And also for supporting our research faculty is some of their labs still had to be open uh, to work and, you know, they, they still need us there to help them with uh, the, the work that we're always doing for them. <clears throat> and physical access to library and resources. Uh, at first, I think a lot of us were trying to at least stay open with some limited hours uh, so that people could come in and get our print re their print resources. Uh, now that's not available. So um, we've really done, I think, a good job moving into a, uh, e-only environment and really working with everybody to get um, whatever uh, is available out there online to them and really have to give a shout out to our vendors who's uh, also stepped up to help us with that. And then uh, reaching out to university communications to make sure that the information re releases are out there accurate, making sure that they had access to uh, reliable information. And a lot of times they partnered with us to make sure that the library guides, our lib guides were out there, uh, easy to access for everyone. And then we also did a few other good key steps. Uh, we really ramped up our, I know at least at Penn State, we really ramped up our online reference services. Uh, we took time to develop a COVID-19 FAQ for the librarians ask, answering um, chat and email questions. 
and we developed uh, COVID uh, specific uh, lib guides, uh, especially for helping uh, students with doing research in these areas. Uh, library workshops and instructions going online. A lot, of, a lot of us were used to teaching in computer labs. Now we're uh, doing it via Zoom. So, <clears throat> so really, really appreciate uh, the efforts we've done there. And as I mentioned, our vendors really stepped up to the plate to give us access to the uh, collections. But once we had access to them, we had to figure out how are we going to make available what we wanted our uh, students and faculty to have access to and how to best incorporate it into our uh, library collections. And then with the uh, uh, perfect, perfect app, ah, uh, personal protective equipment uh, shortage as a result of the pandemic. A lot of libraries uh, put their 3D printing to use to help uh, our fellow uh, colleagues, uh, nurses, physicians, other allied health care workers. Uh, and then this last one, I'm not entirely sure everybody had thought about it, but um, you know, making sure we reach out to the university health clinics and counseling services to make sure that they know we're still there for them. Uh, that, you know, these physicians are going to be seeing, pay, uh, maybe seeing students who come down with COVID-19 or uh, have other things that, that are not necessarily seen and that they know that the library can provide information to them. And also the counseling, working with counseling services so that we can, uh, uh, develop good uh, mental health resources, uh, not only for for them to provide their services, but for them to refer uh, our students to. <clears throat> so, also from some of the questions you submitted, I wanted to make sure we touched on some distance learning resources specific for the librarian. And, uh, Basically, at least at the college level, uh, looking at what kind of training is available from your institution and what's uh, available uh, for integrating uh, resources into your learning management systems. Uh, I've attended, I don't know how many IT training sessions on how to use Zoom effectively. I think like three or four and some of the other commercial resources out there. Uh, also, take a look at the ACRL standards for distance library or distance learning library services if you, you actually haven't yet. Um, you can pick up some good tips. Uh, it also is a really good resource for libraries moving forward to make sure that they're uh, uh, prepared for whenever we ha have, God forbid, another pandemic or a regional epidemic or a disaster, uh, natural or man-made, where our campuses locally may be closed. And then uh, look around at what some of your colleagues are doing uh, in, the, in the library and academic world. Uh, there's a lot of guides out there that really uh, have been very useful for doing this. And there's a lot of commercial resources out there. Uh, one of my favorites uh, is Coursera because it's a uh, it's free unless you want to get the uh, credits for uh, uh, for doing the training. If you're not worried about that, you know, go, you can go through a course in sometimes 50 minutes or or a couple weeks uh, to really uh, hone your skills in this area. <clears throat> Uh, I, I think the pandemic has also uh, brought attention to uh, collection development moving forward, uh, especially now that we really understand that we need to have uh, remotely accessible collections uh, available for all of our students, regardless of major. So, uh, providing access, including proxy access to our resources, uh, um, benchmarking against what we have access to print. Uh, it also gives us a chance to really look at what's out there open access and open education resource wise to, uh, you know, 
what it what is freely available in um, that's going to really help us and how uh, we can really move these movements uh, forward. Uh, and the Medical Library Association uh, Collection Development Caucus has produced a collection development practices guide specific for the health sciences and I'm provided a link there and it's uh, freely accessible uh, to download from there. And if you're not familiar with how to do uh, collection development uh, within the health sciences, it's, it, it's, a, good, uh, it's a good resource. Uh, and also, uh, as when you get into the academic health sciences, uh, the Medical Library Association has many caucuses that have core collection information available for their specific areas. Uh, some of them are publicly available and some of them are available only for members. Um, if you have somebody in your library that's a member of MLA, uh, you know, just, just ask them. Um, Medical Library Association just went through a uh, reorganization to where everybody uh, within with the membership can join any or all caucuses and get access to all of their resources. Um, if you're looking for core clinical titles, uh, especially for doing clinical support, uh, PubMed, Med, Medline, there is an abridged index medicus journal title list, um, which I've used in the past when I uh, was at uh, Central Michigan University helping start up their medical school. It was a good uh, list to, uh, to start that your journal collection and then move, move on from there. And uh, I, I it was really a, a great resource, but it, it is mostly uh, medically oriented, but it does include some uh, nursing allied health titles. <clears throat> And then there's some core uh, medical librarianship journals out there that include reviews, columns, or other articles pertinent to collection development, such as the Journal of the Medical Library Association. And these four Taylor and Francis online journals, um, some of you may have subscriptions to some or all of them. Uh, you know, just go through, see what you can find. And then, as I mentioned, uh, there is a resource, a commercial resource out there, uh, Duty Enterprises. Uh, they do have some free newsletters, and there's a link. Uh, the Duties Collection Development Monthly and the Duties Court Titles Newsletter. Uh, and they will give you uh, pointers on or reviews of uh, resources and books that um, you uh, as a current awareness. And then those actually support their commercial services. Uh, Duties Re Review Services is a collection uh, a, of book reviews done by uh, healthcare professionals and, and librarians. And then Duties Core Titles, it takes that a little further and breaks down the uh, book collections into uh, core suggestions of uh, titles that uh, you can use. And uh, the links are there. Uh, they're cost-effective cost effect, cost resources. If somebody has questions about them, I'm more than happy to answer them during the question and answer, or somebody can just feel free to contact me directly about them if you have questions. Uh, and as far as consumer health resources, uh, the Consumer and Patient Health Information Caucus is a great starting point. Um, includes a lot of recommendations for books and websites uh, for getting started in consumer health. And then referring back to Good Duties core titles, they do include patient education book recommendations. <clears throat> and then an area, some areas of concentration, I want to try to be uh, I'm going to be rushing through this just a little bit to be uh, cognizant of time. But a lot of what we can do is start providing uh, resources to our uh, end users um, to help deal with uh, 
the mental health aspects of the pandemic. And I, I really think it's come down to stress management. And in particular, you've got some areas such as uh, fear management on uh, dealing with COVID-19, whether, you, whether you've uh, caught it or trying to avoid catching it. Uh, and then we've, we've been doing a lot of uh, support with learning and teaching online and with telecommuting. And also, um, job and income security uh, has, has been uh, very fearful. So if we can uh, uh, provide resources to help people with that, that would be useful. Uh, along with how to deal with social isolation, or you know, if you're living alone, all the way up to what I could call mass confinement. You've got a family of five living in, together in a two bedroom apartment and two of the people are telecommuting and you've got, and the rest of the kids in the house are e-learning uh, at the same time. So, so you've got to you know, really deal with that. And I think a lot of us are experiencing Zoom fatigue so if we can do some stuff there, that would be good. And this is something I think we could do, we could do at, at any time moving forward, providing healthy habit resources, such as eating, sleeping, exercise. And then just don't concentrate on what's available through the library, but go out and you know, create guides for, for these types of resources. And I'm just going to provide some lists available. These slides are going to be available along with the recording. Uh, so there's some general mental, mental health wellness resources from the American Psychological Association, the CDC. And I also want to really point out the National Alliance for Mental Health, NAMI. Uh, they have a really great guide and they're a really great patient education resource. Uh, student support. Take a look at what some of the, the other colleges have been doing. Um, um, California Community Colleges, Vanderbilt University, and Temple University have some really good ones that I have come across um, as good starting points. <clears throat> and as far as exercise habits, uh, you know, there's not just government resources out there, but you've got uh, professional organizations like the American College of Sports Medicine, American Society for Nutrition, and even the World Health Organization. And then healthcare for the workforce. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine has some really good uh, resources along with the American Medical Association. I come back to the American Psychological Association and even the American Psychiatric Association as really good resources to, uh, to utilize. And then uh, I'm just going to make sure that you know, I did mention the Medical Library Association. Uh, they do have uh, their COVID-19 resource for, uh, for patients and the public. And if you're not familiar with health sciences librarianship, take a look at their code of ethics for health sciences librarianship and their guide on health information professions. And they also have uh, a couple of professional specializations I think are very useful right now for dealing with pandemics and other kinds of emergencies. Uh, there's a consumer health information specialization and there's also a disaster information uh, specialization. And for my library, we have one librarian who uh, just acquired her disaster information specialization and I am one um, class away from uh, completing my consumer health information specialization. So we're gonna, we're gonna have uh, people within our library being able to cover both of these areas. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody and I am going to uh, go ahead and turn it over now to uh, Kate. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, everybody, uh, for coming today. Um, 
I am Kate Fluelling. I'm the executive director of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Middle Atlantic Region. And uh, my quick disclaimer is that uh, we are supported by the National Library of Medicine under a cooperative agreement with the University of Pittsburgh Health Sciences Library System. And the content is solely the responsibility of the author, me, and does not represent um, the official views of the National Institutes of Health. So that funding statement gives you a little bit of an idea of um, where we're from and how we're connected with the National Library of Medicine. Uh, so the National Library of Medicine is part of the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library. It funds eight regional medical libraries across the country uh, to support uh, our mission of improving access to um, biomedical information for both the public and professionals. And currently the um, grant uh, for the Middle Atlantic region is with the University of Pittsburgh and we serve libraries of all kinds, um, health organizations, any organization that is providing or using health information in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. We support our mission um, in three major ways, uh, training um, online, in person and at conferences. I will be predominantly talking about our online training today. Uh, funding for uh, health information outreach and professional development. And we're a membership organization of 1200 plus libraries of all kinds, community-based organizations and others. And I too will have a lot of uh, links in my slides, um, but as Amy said, uh, we, you will be getting all of the slides um, later at, after the presentation. So I won't be talking a lot about specific uh, COVID-19 resources. The National Library of Medicine has asked us to share that it's an emerging, rapidly evolving situation. And to get the latest public health information, um, go to the CDC at coronavirus.gov or get the latest research information from NIH at nih.gov slash coronavirus. But I am going to talk more generally about five different um, NLM information resources that I believe are of particular interest um, to college and research uh, libraries, but would also be of interest um, to other kinds of libraries, including K through 12 and public. I'm going to talk about PubMed, OpenEye, clinicaltrials.gov, Medline Plus, and PubChem. I saw uh, several familiar names on the registration list. Um, so I know a lot of you know about uh, one or more of these resources, but I think each of them um, are particularly useful as you're supporting distance learning. So PubMed is the premier biomedical literature database. Uh, there's over 30 million citations. It's updated daily. It's great for researchers, students, instructors, et cetera. Um, the database itself is available for free, and then it links to um, freely available journal articles and other resources, um, largely through PubMed Central, and then to vendor and um, library uh, links. There is a new PubMed. Um, it came out in October of 2019. There is a new interface, greater mobile capability, abstract snippets, um, the ability to cite and share. Uh, there are results by year timeline and a lot of back end improvements um, that improve um, the uh, sensitivity of, of the searches. The new PubMed becomes the default on May 18th, um, 2020. That was announced last week. Uh, there is an NLM technical bulletin article about uh, new PubMed, which also links to a lot of information about the new PubMed, um, an FAQ, as well as um, something of particular interest to um, us as librarians is there's a new PubMed trainers toolkit and that includes slide decks that you can just put into your information literacy presentations, handouts, quick tours, um, including a version that you can put right into course management systems which um, so many of um, you are now supporting uh, students who were in person and now at a distance. 
there's also links to training for the trainer. And my organization, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, uh, is doing regular webinars about PubMed, but there's also a lot of on-demand training as well. Open Eye is a really cool semi-experimental uh, search engine from NLM. It's a biomedical image search engine. It searches PubMed articles in several special collections. Uh, it links images to the source article. It's really great for our students um, and faculty members looking to actually see an example of something that they're um, searching, but also to find out more information if they have an image. Um, there's a way, much like uh, Google Images, to drop an image into the search engine and the search engine will actually look through um, to find similar images. The other neat thing about OpenEye is you can search by um, copyright and um, by uh, images that are available to use um, through Creative Commons. So this is um, a search for a tibial plateau fracture. And you can see once you do a quick search, there are different limits. So you can look at different subsets, um, such as orthopedics or um, collections, license type, uh, specialties. And then um, you find the images, and then it will link to um, available um, additional resources, such as the PubMed article. Clinicaltrials.gov is a repository of past and current clinical trials around the world. Um, most US trials, other than um, observational trials and animal studies, have to be registered in clinicaltrials.gov. Submissions are reviewed for clarity, um, but it's important to note that they have not been peer reviewed. Um, and so these are whether the clinical trial is sponsored by academia or industry, um, it is the um, responsibility of the research team to put in the information and in clinical trials. Um, some completed studies actually include results summaries. This is really important when you're talking about emerging issues um, and also knowing that um, there's a big tendency to only publish positive results in literature. Um, to have, be able to look at um, the actual results from the clinical trials um, can be an important source of information um, if you're doing, um, say, a systematic review or, or something that you need to actually see all of the research. It's also meant to be a way that um, patients can look and healthcare providers can look for um, current recruiting trials. The uh, site has been redesigned recently, um, so you can limit by recruiting uh, studies. You can search by the condition or disease or a particular drug name, uh, country, and state. They've added a link uh, right from the homepage of clinicaltrials.gov uh, to limit to studies on COVID-19 um, and also um, a box that includes uh, clinical studies related to COVID-19 um, from other sources. Brad was talking about the importance of consumer health information at this time. Medline Plus is the National Institutes of Health's uh, premier consumer health resource. There's over a thousand health topics. It's uh, in English and Spanish. There's also limited information in about 40 other languages. There's information about drugs and supplements. There's no advertisements or endorsements. Um, there's a medical encyclopedia and medical test information um, embedded into the site. It's very easy to use. Um, for those of you who are in um, academia, some of the topics that might be of interest um, to your students and faculty might be evaluate, evaluating health information, understanding medical research, environmental health, 
complementary and alternative medicine, college health, health occupations. This is a great first start um, place to look at all kinds of health occupations and a variety of de diseases and conditions. And it's all meant um, for the layperson. But it's also could be useful. I know um, nursing students and others have used it um, to get a nice overview of a particular health condition or health topic. This is an example of a Medline Plus health topic. It gives you a quick summary and then links to reliable sources on um, diagnosis, uh, treatments, therapies, um, living with um, complementary therapy and depending on how deep you want to go into it also information about clinical trials and journal articles on the topic back to more of an academic um, site but for those of you who uh, want to test your knowledge of the periodic table there's an interactive periodic table and game um, in PubChem. PubChem is the world's largest collection of freely accessible chemical information. Um, it is a database that um, researchers can put in um, different chemical structures, um, information about the chemical and physical properties, biological activities, safety of substances, um, patents, literature. You can search by name, chemical formula, structure. Um, so you can actually um, put in um, the structure or draw the structure of a chemical and see what it is or what it cl is closely related to. And there are another um, National Library of Medicine resource that has put on their homepage um, a search directly to um, COVID-19 uh, data available. And the periodic table um, game is is pretty fun, and I know a lot of you are um, have K through 12 students at home um, in addition to supporting your library patrons, um, and it's it's a pretty fun uh, game that you can do easy, um, medium, or or most difficult. I want to direct your attention to a virtual engagement activity that we do um, twice a year at NLM, and that is a Wikipedia edit-a-thon. And each, um, in the spring and the fall, um, there's always a specific uh, topic. Um, so we've done health disparities, women's health, um, April's, uh, Wikipedia edit-a-thon is on preventive health. And so you can uh, participate virtually at any time during the month um, by signing on to our dashboard and start editing. Um, this is a way to add uh, links to reliable sources uh, such as PubMed and Medline Plus and Genetics Home Reference into um, Wikipedia pages. So as much as we would love people to go to Medline Plus for all of their health information needs, we know that many, many, many more people go to Wikipedia than all of the NLM resources combined. And so this is a way to make sure that those resources um, have links to high quality health information. We're going to do an all day uh, virtual edit-a-thon on the 30th next Thursday um, if you want to get involved with that. And so that is something that's virtual now but is um, all, something that we, we've been doing for the past couple of years um, every six months in the spring and the fall. There are so many ways that you can um, get trained on NLM resources and other resources um, related to providing any sort of health information. Um, I want to um, provide you with uh, some topics that are from upcoming webinars and also from um, on-demand classes. Everything that we do is available for free. A lot of it has um, 
credit for MLA um, also for those two um, specializations that Brad mentioned earlier, the consumer health and the disaster um, information specialization. So a couple upcoming webinars that I thought would be of particular interest to academic librarians, um, exploring data literacy needs at your institution, preprint prints and PubMed Central, braving the elements, PubChem resources to weather any situation, still searching for One Health, information services that prov support prevention of emerging zoonotic disease. This Friday, um, there will be an NIH webinar that NLM staff are participating on, um, on sh sharing, discovering, and citing COVID-19 data and code, so you can learn more about NLM resources specific um, to COVID-19, um, as, as well as um, a bigger picture NIH view. We have over 20 on-demand courses um, that include dissemination and disasters using information to save lives. That's um, a class that you can use towards your disaster info uh, specialization. Cool creative communications, dazzling data visualization online on demand, and PubMed Essentials 2020, where you can get all the scoop on new PubMed. We also have a YouTube channel with so many um, recent recordings. I was looking at the questions um, that you all put in and tried to pull out some um, specific webinars on those topics. Um, so some recent uh, recordings include privacy research and clinical text de-identification with NLM Scrubber, which is a, a new experimental uh, resource from NLM. The DNA to Z of direct to consumer genetic testing separating fact from fiction. Overview of the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA. Health literacy in an academic environment. Data presentations, the good, bad, and unethical. We've been um, with uh, MLA and with OSL, the Association of Academic Health Sciences Libraries. Um, we have been sponsoring a monthly diversity, equity, and inclusion series. Uh, there's a webinar on resources for nursing and allied healthcare professionals. And one of the registrants had asked about a replacement for the National Guideline Clearinghouse. And in September, uh, we actually uh, had the ECRI Guidelines Trust, um, which has created a similar product for free. Um, and we had those, um, those folks come and talk to our members. And all of those recordings are available on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to sign up for our weekly postings that come out on Friday to get the most recent information about NLM products and services, training, and funding from um, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. And with that, I'll thank you very much and um, hand it back to Amy for questions. All right, thank you so much. So at this point, if you have a question, feel free to add it to the chat box. Um, I'm just gonna go through our chat that we had going on during the presentation, just to point out a couple of things. Um, one, uh, Brad had mentioned earlier, one of the evaluation tools being if I apply, we actually had a presentation on that through the Connect and Communicate series previously, and Erin did put a link to that in our chat box. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. Um, yeah, I think that was everything. Um, just confirming that, yes, we will be sending out the slides and um, the PowerPoint after the presentation's over, so feel free to share. And at this point, if anyone has any questions, feel free to add them to the chat box. Um, so if you do have to head out, Erin um, did put a link to our evaluation form in the chat box as well. We do appreciate that you fill that out for us.
Okay, someone asked, do you use a disclaimer when giving health information? If so, any tips of what to include and how to write one? Uh, <clears throat> generally, don't, um, being I work on the uh, medical school side of things, uh, we're generally not using disclaimers, but when I have, but we have used them when I've uh, worked with uh, health libraries and along the lines, you just indicate that, uh, you know, we're not a, we're not medical uh, professionals. Um, you know, th this information is provided to, provided to you as a guide, but if you have specific questions, uh, please consult your healthcare provider. So, so always referring them back to their healthcare provider for the for the more in-depth questions is always good. And you know, trying to make sure that they understand that no, I'm not going to diagnose you just because I'm a medical librarian or a librarian. Yeah, our our role is always as librarians to provide the best possible uh, information for the intended audience. Um, Brad had linked to the ethics of our professional association, the Medical Library Association, as far as providing um, health reference. Um, there's also plenty of examples um, if you feel more comfortable of providing a disclaimer that essentially says what Brad says is that these are these resources are for informational purposes, um, but please consult your healthcare provider. Oh, and I can think of one place that was, uh, uh, has a really good disclaimer right on the website. Uh, both Kate and I had worked at SUNY Upstate uh, Medical University in Syracuse, uh, overlapping uh, for about a year and a half, and we had, and up there is a uh, consumer health library. And right, right on the uh, website is a really good disclaimer uh, along the lines of what we both discussed. And then LM also has um, some intro consumer health um, classes, uh, including a class called Beyond an Apple a Day. And I believe that class gives some examples of disclaimers. Thank you. Someone else asked, what type of information literacy sessions do you provide for your medical school students? I'll let you answer that, Brad, since I don't have medical students. Uh, kind of information literacy to the medical students? Um, anything from intro to PubMed? Um, um, Intro to evidence-based medicine, advanced evidence-based medicine, uh, citation management software, um, using online resource, or using uh, using our one button studio to create videos, uh, workshops on three, uh, creating your own 3D printing. Um, basically, if our students, possibly could ask a question about it. We try to uh, develop some sort of workshop around it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, what I can do is, uh, I will sh share our library uh, training uh, page uh, so that you can see the types of workshops that, that we do provide at, at the uh, Harrow Health Sciences Library for Penn State, um, if you want to get a, a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing. Thank you. Okay. Can you recommend a COVID-19 website which provides current state-by-state -state statistics on the number of tests that have been performed or is the John Hopkins COVID website the best source? I would say the Hopkins site is the best source. Okay. 
and um, as I said, NLM is asking us to direct people to the CDC and NIH, um, so I'm not familiar with other um, sources for that kind of information. We do have a number of thank yous on this page too, which I haven't read. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I appreciate them. I'm going to, I'm making uh, uh, a list of some of the questions where I say, said I'd be posting, uh, posting the links. Uh, I'll just include them at the end of my uh, slides so that you do have them. Um, so instead of me trying to spend time and try to get them in the chat right mm -hmm. now, uh, I think that would be the most efficient way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, someone said, I like, and they listed a URL, um, covidtracking.com um, with some other backslashes in there as well. I don't know if either of you have heard of that, but I just thought I'd say that was in the chat box. Cumulative record of our daily totals. So. Um, well, I'm reading through the thank yous and it's so nice um, to hear all of those. Uh, this, our team um, at NNLM, MAR, also does um, webinars for uh, your staff. Um, we do a train the trainer model, so um, we don't go into individual classes, but we're always happy to um, tailor any sort of training um, or information session for library staff, um, please feel free to reach out. My contact information will be on my slides. Thank you. And I, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces from my past out there. Uh, not necessarily to call everybody out individually, but uh, hello to those of you I haven't seen in a while. So feel free to keep adding questions to the chat box, but I know some people are heading out and I have some closing remarks. So feel free to keep adding questions. We keep taking those, but for those of you who do need to go, um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And I'd like to thank Brad and Kate for presenting for us. I hope everyone will take a few moments to complete our survey and let us know your thoughts about the presentation today and about our programming in general. And Erin just put that link in the chat box again. Um, as a reminder, the recording of this presentation will be made available to PLA members early next week through the PLA website and you will get an email as well with that information. If you are not a PALA member and you are interested in becoming a member, please feel free to email any of our committee members and we will have the appropriate person contact you. I also invite you to contact any of our committee members with your suggestions for future discussions and presentations. And I most definitely invite you to contact one of us if you'd like to present for us. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon, have a nice day. And if you have questions, again, please feel free to keep adding those to the chat box. It looks like most people are leaving. I'm going to go ahead yep. and stop recording if that's okay.